So um, what we're going to do in this church, and then we're going to move over to the, um, the Mass House, the Taliyah Mass House. We're just going to have uh, uh, four short readings um, that are, uh, uh, some are poetry and some are prose, um, that are written by um, writers from Fermanagh and Oma, um, inspired by uh, World War uh, one decade, the decade of centenaries. So they're based on on that. And uh, I won't say any more as an introduction, John James. With this, do you want to introduce yourself and just? Yes. Um, my name is John Claudin James. I'm um, I'm a poet, and I I I, I resided now the past eight years in Enniskillen, and I have to say. Uh, Go to uh, a Baptist chapel every Sunday, in, in, up until the age of 14, I think. Uh, I have always wanted to do this. So this <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a voice from, from, from 1916. This is called Wild of Mind. Bottom line. In the end, it was not the endangerment of my soul that occupied most of the concerns of my father, nor even the base corruption of my innocent flesh that still br- brings such potent flame to feminine cheeks. With, with, with the very recollection of, of memories too candid, rather, it was a fated encounter with a wilder mind. How do I explain this to an unfettered generation who, whose lives are lived unencumbered by convention, with preternatural sophistication that astounds me so? My girlhood was spent at some ease in a gilded cage, peering out onto a world that was chosen too fast. A fairground carousel that would not pause for me. My grandparents lived through the Crimean War. Many were unmanned by the tumult of those times. Bestowed their children with the fragility of life. My father sought solace and comfort in the church after his boarding school, college and seminary. He secured a comfortable parish in a rural idyll. My mother lived in a place that I never visited. She only decorated the diorama of my childhood. A mute swan floating serenely from room to room. Outside, she glided from house to automobile to shop, or wherever her ethereal presence was commanded. With seeming little volition, you could call hers. I was raised in a parsonage of generous proportions, yet so much was off limits by my father's dictate. I was escorted to family rooms by dear Danny Grace <coughs> until I retraced those exact same steps on my own. No other thought ever occurred to me to do different. I fell into line with scarce plate from a rebel heart. I was seventeen before I slipped the captive bonds, father, somewhat assured of my mature sensibility, to go walking in the woods or down by the canal. The, the untamed young men of his fevered imaginings were scarce, and women now worked the fields. Kitchener's harvest had turned the world topsy-turvy. The sun seemed to be burning up the entire earth. So hot it was on that day that I first met Esme. She was naked as Eve as she came out of the water. I turned my head away in a cultish embarrassment. But I was drawn to her skin, swarthy with sun, with droplets of water that sparkled as diamonds. Unabashed, she beckoned me over with a smile. As she stood on the bank, toweling herself down, before tying her still damp mane of 
gypsy curls, the blackest shade of many a darkest night. We were just a single strand of bosun's twine before donning a simple shift with plural pattern. Esme was a water gypsy, busy working the canals. Two older brothers now haven't gone to France. Her family thus relied on her for an income. I was much dazzled by her worldly intelligence that diminished the learning from my books. Her uncommon poise, her confidence and grace. We would meet regularly after that first time. I would bring food, filched from our kitchen, that she consumed hungrily with gratitude and then taken home all of which remained. I couldn't imagine living from hand to mouth, but she made the virtue of this grim necessity. Esme would often laugh so raucously at me at the layers I removed to swim with her, my whole naked body would flush furiously, but I was determined to show my courage in throwing off the shackles of convention to be as fancy free as I imagined her to be. <coughs> Oftentimes, we would just let our flesh bake as we lay together on the roof of Celeste, the barge she used to transport the freight. She would hold my hand, fingers entwined, and tell me all the many adventures She had had, I believed every word slipped from her lips. My soft fair skin burned in that coarse sun <coughs> as we treated it with homemade chamomile. The creamy lotion and gentle hands soothed. I still put the herb in my bed linen laundry so that my sheets and pillowcases may sing that planted lullaby of the sweetest memory. The world had changed on that sultry summer. Perhaps it was just me, but everything felt odd. I was now taller and I stood up to my father, told him, telling him politely <coughs> that I had my own ideas. I, I would thus follow my own path with dignity, blessed with the light of Esme's wilder mind. Thank you. The next uh, person, um, thank you, John James. The next person we have to uh, recite is Phelan O'Neill uh, from the Oma area. And Phelan has published a book recently of poems that he wrote um, um, of the World War I, uh, inspired by World War I. And you'll read one of them now. Thank you, John. I noticed one of the plaques in the wall is a member of the Millen family who goes to a general ship in the army, and so this poem is dedicated to those who served in the First World War. It's called Rules of Engagement. The man was held upright by the coiled wire, his body tight wrapped in its barbed embrace. He was struck in many places by shell fire, an eyelid flickered briefly in his face. He clung to hope as the wire clung to him, suspended on the precipice of life. For death had marked him out, but on a whim had moved to where the fighting was more rife. He stirred and slept as fever took his toll, his body stilled to minimise the pain. The tide of battle ceased the sunward roll, and no man's land returned to hush again. His mind escaped and took him in his toe, set him down in fields of stubble gold, fields he learned to ply and then to sow the shire horse responsive to his hold. A farmer's lad was always his ambition. He had a way with horses, so they said. He'd even won a ploughing competition, the rosette fixed at home above his bed. A foam of blood congealed upon his lip, the wire jangled to his spasmed cough. The cruel barbs maintained their piercing grip and made him cry aloud through bloody froth. A watchful sniper saw the body move and studied it more closely through his glass. Geneva rules would not indeed improve, approve 
But mercy here was of a different class. The body quivered once, but could not fall. The sniper's deadly echo died away. Death had not forgotten, after all. The farmer's lad was home amongst the hay. Beautiful. Thank you, Fiona. Um, next we have Brian Mullen from Oma, who's going to actually read um, a piece of prose um, called The Kit Gun. Those stairs are very tricky. They're very narrow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, these few words are based on a story I heard from. I had a very good friend, a school friend. His father was from Scotland and had been in the Black Watch Regiment during the First War and survived the war. That was always, of course, reluctant to talk about it, but school boys and uh, we pursued him and per persecuted him to hear stories about what it was like at the front. And, well, he would tell us what suited our age. He didn't uh, scare any of us with some of it. But uh, these few words are based on st one story he recounted. It's entitled The Kip Bag. We are going on three days rest and recuperation from the hell that is our trench on the front line. The large rats here are a bloody nuisance. And the constant bombardment from the big guns behind. Our guns have us driven to distraction. Yesterday, Jimmy Jones nearly lost it, almost flopped. We got him steadied up, but doubt if he will be able to cope when the whistle blows with a big push over the top, which will surely come when we return from leave. This kit bag gets heavier by the day. I would love to be free of it at least for the rest period from the nearby town. But perish the thought. If I lose or must place my kit bag, I will be on a charge. But worse, I will have lost the few personal possessions I have. My shaving kit, my letters from home, and the little lock of Mary's hair. My gas mask. Our bullet in the rest station is an old agricultural barn on the outskirts of the town. My God, it is like the Ritz Hotel, a proper camp bed to rest and sleep on. The boom boom of the big guns is much more muted here. No whine of oncoming shells. We can walk into town, meet civilians, buy extra cigarettes, hear ourselves talking. I have found a niche in the corner of our barn where I might hide my kit bag, but I'm reluctant to let it out of my sight. Knuckles McKeown is a survivor, a good soldier, brave but dangerous and not to be crossed. He always had plenty of cigarettes and tobacco. Has a name for street fighting and a reputation for sailing close to the wind in relation to the law and military regulations. He occupied the bed next to me. We were not overly many, but he inquired what I was looking for. I reluctantly confided that I was searching for a safe place to leave my kit bag. He jumped off his bed walked to the corner of the barn, pointed to my niche and said, leave it there. I can guarantee you that we'll be safe there. And I knew it would be. Thank you. Um, our last reading here in this church is from Jenny uh, Brian from Balna Mallard, isn't that right where you live, Jenny? In, in County Fermanagh. And uh, Jenny's going to read us a poem called um, Buckets of Bombs. What do you like? There's no other. Back in the early 1970s, 
There was an old man in our village, and the young lads used to laugh at him because he'd say he carried bombs in buckets. And this is about someone like him. You know, I never learned to shoot worth half a dam, but I could tote a bucket with the best. The Flanders mud was firm to me beside for Managlar, and in my hands those canvas buckets rested light and easy as a feed for calves. The dawn was clear that day, first of July. That night we'd lain in no man's land. We dreamed the things at home, the twelfth, the cattle and the turf, the first hay to be mown. We woke to screaming shells, the bugle blew. We ran through where the wire had been cut, the lads had done their part. To where the sun was rising and the shells still burst, I got there first. I crossed that crooked trench in one long stride, while Frank and Charlie, close behind, the bayonet men, dropped down to do their work, cleaning the shop, they said. The shelling stopped a moment. In the calm, a sparrow sang. The thrower, oh, I never could recall his name, Petora boy, and good at games, he had the bowling knack, whispered grenades, held out his hands. And so I placed two there and ran ahead, counted to five, fell sh flat to shelter from the blasts, grateful to be alive, while on the hill behind, beyond the range of shell, the German guns replied, men fell, my friends, black crows had peeled upon a maze of barbs and blood. Then, when the shaking stopped, I rose, I heard a moan come from the trench below, cut short as Frank or Charlie did their work. Again I handed out the bombs, I ran above that trench, I fell before the blasts, I rose again, again, then, then, I ran too near, could see inside, the men in terror there who looked me in the eyes said, Camarade! One lad, his ears stuck out just like young Duncan of the Glen. The thrower cried, why have you stopped? We have no time. Grenades. And I, I handled them. They sent me home to work my land. Now, over fifty years are gone, young lads who never knew of war except for what they read in Hotspur and Commando, still are wishing that they were as I was then, yet having heard of bombs and beer kegs and in cars, poor scorn on me who carried in my time bombs by that bucket, I, and still bear the scars.